Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name's Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. If you've listened to even one of the episodes, you know that I care about humanity first, eliminating energy poverty. And I mean, we've got a long way to go on understanding how to get that done. I've got a third time guest today, Mr. Doomberg, who is, I believe, the number one sub stack in the energy and investment area. Is that correct, Mr. Doomberg? Hey, good morning, Stu. Great to see you. Um, nice to see Chris as well, who you'll introduce next, I'm sure. But yeah, we're actually in the finance category on Substack, and we're the number one paid finance Substack uh, in the world, which is crazy to say, but um, there you and- go. And I want to give you a shout out. Just we were talking before the show and you did so well at NAEP. There were so many people that came up to the booth and said, we heard Doomberg's going to be here. (laughs) (laughs) And they all lined up to get your autograph, sir. So it was absolutely way cool. Hey, absolutely on today. Uh, Old friend, um, Chris Wright. Chris and I met years ago, and Chris is the CEO of Liberty Energy. And Chris is definitely a master of what I always look at in investing for a good company, good management, good numbers. And not Chris, not only do you lead your company, when you lined them up and drank your own frac fluid years ago, I thought that was pretty cool. When you, when you sit back and kind of go, I lead by example. That was a funny YouTube video. But Chris, thank you for stopping by. Glad to be here, Stu, and an honor to be on a podcast with Doomy for the first time. So good to go. Um, I'll tell you what. Let's get started on a couple topics here. Uh, Chris, you just released out your uh, updated uh, Bettering Human Lives report. And there are some key takeaways out of this. And I thought that we would just visit about your thoughts on, on this and your key takeaway number 10. I mean, I'm having that tattooed on the wall behind me. Uh, it is z- zero energy poverty by 2050 is a superior goal compared to net zero 2050. How cool is that? I'm sorry. I'm I'm going to borrow that one. Well, I mean, it's kind of a, a summary of the whole report, which is just trying to put climate change in context of the challenges with energy access, which are not just in the poor world. You know, a quarter of Americans struggle to pay their energy bills and 10 percent don't heat their homes to safe temperatures. The problem with net zero 2050 sort of is twofold. One, it's it's nowhere remotely achievable, but the efforts trying to achieve it have been quite destructive. As we show in the energy addition section of that report, the fastest growing energy source on the planet the last 12 years is natural gas. Second is oil. Third is coal. Wind and solar are fourth and six, and they're in double, di- they're in single digits. So we're nowhere near even the start of an energy transition, let alone finish one by 2050. And when we have much more urgent problems on the planet, and you can't solve any of them without reliable, affordable, secure energy. So when we get back to your, your uh, also in this report, uh, they can go to your website, libertyenergy.com, and take a look at the entire report, because there's some great stuff in that entire report, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, Bettering Human Lives 2024. So yeah, definitely expanded, meaningfully different than, uh, than the previous two versions. Um, now, Doomberg, you came out yesterday with a great article, and I, I'll tell you, when you talk about uh, changing how we eliminate energy poverty, and then you take a look at the regulatory actions going on, your article yesterday was Climate Newspeak. Can you tell us what you were thinking on this? You know, really interesting to hear both you and Chris's framing of the issue, which is consistent with ours, which starts with a a human centric analysis. So um, the big disparity between the net zero crowd and the net energy poverty crowd is one puts humanity and humans at the center of their analysis and the other puts nature or the planet and almost views humans as a cancer on nature and uh, (laughs) something to be eliminated. I mean, that's in all transparency, the, the foundational Malthusian thinking of the of the climate change crowd um, doesn't view 
optimizing human flourishing as a worthy objective. And I think that just needs to be stated. Now, Chris also said something that I wholeheartedly agree with is that net zero by 2050 is, is impossible, literally. And um, it's not gonna happen. And as the realities of physics are beginning to sort of present themselves, that sort of the, the, the quantum uh, equation is collapsing and we're going to find out whether the cat is alive or dead when we open the box. Um, <laughs> the hysterics amongst the climate crowd are beginning to reach extreme levels and dangerous levels. And so in the piece we published yesterday, we wrote about um, this crazy move in Canada to make it a crime to speak positively about fossil fuels. Um, and then followed that up with a really dangerous report by some outfit called uh, the Center for Countering Digital Hate, which formulated a, it literally the Orwellian phrase, quote, new denial, which is meant to associate people who are critiquing wind and solar energy, basically, as the equivalent of Holocaust deniers. Um, the word denier and denial is offensive. I mean, let's be very clear. Um, it, it is a form of minimizing Hitler's uh, atrocities, if you think about it um, long enough. And I, I find the word deeply offensive, but um, having said that, it's in the vernacular now. Um, so um, basically, this report from this nonprofit, in air quotes, um, led by a very interesting character, um, is pressuring YouTube to demonetize basically anybody who is center right uh, on energy, including a who's who of basically every. Uh, libertarian slash conservative think tank in the U.S. and in Canada, the Fraser Institute was on there, and um, many podcasts that I've been a guest on, for example, were also called out. And then we ended the piece by saying, how long before they do a giant expose on Substack with the green chicken uh, at the heart of it? Because that's what's coming next. And so uh, we, we wrote that piece basically to highlight the absurdity of what's going on in the echo chamber of the, of the extreme environmental left, but also uh, to, to front run and get ahead of what we believe is just inevitable. Chris, you have you look like you're about to say something there. Yeah, well, I started a little more than a year ago. I made a 12 minute video. Just be honest, just giving it was sort of a summary of the last Better Human Erupt Lives report in 12 minutes. You know, just some basic facts about energy and climate change and energy right. economic climate economics um, all condensed into a brief thing. And YouTube took it down three times for misinformation and then frauds and scams. Um, Wall Street Journal ended up writing a piece on it um, saying, oh, what a controversial video. They called around climate scientists. I said, please do. They found one guy who disagreed with one thing I said in the 12 minute video. It turns out he was wrong as well on that point. And I wrote a, I wrote a, a correction after the fact, pointing out how he, he was wrong in the one thing he said I said wrong. But yet just being candid and honest about energy and climate change um, as as Doomy and I do all the time, like that's controversial. People say, aren't you afraid to say those things? I'm like, how can you be a public intellectual and not be honest? You can't you can't spin what you say and be dishonest to align with you know the fashion of the day. That's as 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 we just heard Orwellian. It, it's really frightening. And and when you take a look at exactly what Doomy, as you say, as as Doomberg is. You got to have your own uh, channel out there or you're subjugated. And I'm just going to brag for half a sec on my staff. Last year, we had 26 million people on our new, new site. We had 7.5 million article reads of our uh, podcast transcribed reads. We had uh, 1.2 million downloads of the podcast. But guess what? I can go to Google Analytics at any point and I'll see two people on the site. I go to my firewall and I see 5,000. And, and it's they intentionally are shutting me down because I'm talking about humanitarian. And I figured out a way around it. Now, how much further would my story get out there, Chris? This is just like you got hammered. Um, I've even seen my YouTube's uh, drop a hundred in one day or up to down 10. So, uh, in, in the end, truth and physics will win physics and fiscal responsibility.
Um, Doomberg, when you were sitting here thinking, we were also talking about uh, your financial modeling and stuff. When we take a look at the regulatory issues coming up, how can we finance to net zero? You had said it's impossible. How can we get to lower cost energy with moving forward? It has to be, it can't be wind and solar only. There's no way. Well, it was worse than that. So we developed something a few months ago called Doomberg's postulate, where we said um, every molecule of fossil fuels produced will be consumed by somebody somewhere and local restrictions uh, only shift who gets to enjoy that privilege. So if you're actually wanting to minimize the amount of coal, oil, and natural gas consumed, you have to actually stop its production. But the vast majority of its production does not exist in places like Europe. Um, and, and it exists instead in places like the Middle East and the U.S. So, um, for example, take coal. Um, Indonesia is going to produce as much coal as it can consume domestically and sell uh, on the open market. And Europe, for example, produces no fossil fuels of consequence. There's a bit of coal production, uh, Germany and so on, and Poland still consumes a bit, but they don't produce any oil and they don't produce any natural gas. Fracking is illegal, basically, in Europe, for example. And so Europe can wean itself off fossil fuels all at once. It's not actually going to change the amount of fossil fuels being consumed. It's just going to make it slightly cheaper for other people to do so. And so unless we're talking about outlawing the production of natural gas and oil and coal in the U.S. and in Canada and Australia, um, then the amount of fossil fuels that is going to be consumed uh, will be consistent with what is produced. And any additional energy we bring online, be it intermittent energy like wind and solar or hopefully high density energy like nuclear, will be additive. Um, if you actually look at the total primary energy consumption using the what used to be known as the BP Statistical Review of Energy, um, it just goes up. It goes up at a 1% to 2% per year. And that is the gating factor for global GDP. The more energy we produce, uh, the more energy we produce, the more uh, standard of living we could help uh, increase and then try to share that equitably. Last point I'll make is there's five to six billion people existing probably on an average of 20% of the BTUs per capita that we enjoy in the U.S. Um, who are we to say that they can't climb Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, and, and to um, uh, obtain for their friends and family the, the similar creature comforts of modern life that we have been able to achieve in the West? It is a deeply anti-human position to take. And as they are losing, they're becoming more dangerous uh, in, in using the, the powers and the levers of government to shut things down. Last point I'll say, even if you develop your own channel, you can't escape them. Payment processors, uh, right. they, they'll attack Substack, they'll attack, uh, they'll attack PayPal, uh, they'll attack your bank. Um, it, this is a very dangerous time. We wrote a piece about um, uh, about the the, the, the the British politician whose name escapes me, the Brexit politician, um, and him being debanked. Like this is dangerous. This is this is very very dangerous. And and free thinking people need to stand up and do something about it before it's too late. Yeah. And that, that way you hide your green chicken suit, you know, at the cleaners, they're not going to find it. So. But they will come after Substack next. And it was Nigel Farage. Uh, his name came back. To yeah. Yes. Nigel Farage. But they will come after Substack. Um, they're not going to stop at YouTube. They've already done Twitter um, and, and they're yep. just going to keep going. You bet. And Chris, you had something rolling, rolling through. No, I was just going to throw in Nigel Farage as well as the as the guy in Brexit. Yeah, a lot of the debates or arguments we, we talk about here, they're further along in Europe. So we have somewhat of an indication of what's coming here. I talk a little right. bit about that in Bettering Human Lives. Two quick points, like there's a quick case study on Germany. They spent, depends how you count it, somewhere between a half and a, and a $1 trillion in an economy less than the eighth the size of the United States economy. Um, they more than tripled their electricity prices. They're exporting their industry and blue collar jobs. They're impoverishing their low income people because they can't afford to consume as much energy. And they moved their hydrocarbon consumption from 80% of their total energy to 74% of their total energy consumed. So I don't know that I'd, trend, I'd call that an energy transition. The United Kingdom brags about being the biggest percent reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in any country. 100% that's true, roughly a 40% reduction. What they don't tell you is they've had a 28% reduction in energy consumption. So over three quarters of their decarbonization is just less energy consumed in the United Kingdom because their industry has left. Instead of being a natural gas powered factory in the Midlands of England, it's made in a coal powered factory in China or Vietnam. And 
load it on a diesel power ship and bring the same goods back to the United Kingdom. That's not decarbonization. And the other driver of reduced greenhouse gas emissions is just impoverishment. If you make energy more expensive, yes, people will consume less of it. They'll have less, le less long, less healthy, less opportunity rich lives. But indeed, if you make it very expensive, people will consume less. But that's the only mechanism to make people consume less energy. As, as, as Dumi made the point, everyone wants a better life, a safer life, a healthier right. life, and they're going to pursue it. And, and of course, most of the countries of the world aren't going to do these nonsense policies because you can't export industry from everywhere. It's got to go somewhere. And of course, right. developing nations, China, have welcomed the ability to be the, the, the shop maker, the workhouse of the world. So it's even worse in the UK than Chris alluded to because a big chunk of their quote unquote decarbonization arises from the fact that they count the burning of wood as having zero emissions, right. even though they clear cut forests in the US southeast, um, these giant, beautiful trees that are in, actually in decarbonizing yeah, in Canada, and they burn it. And because it, we called it, uh, I think we wrote Back to the Future was the name of the piece we wrote on this maybe 18 months ago. I have a good memory for the names of our pieces, but um, it's literally, it's the immaculate combustion. It, it shows up. Um, and immaculate and that, combustion? <laughs> yeah. It, uh, all of the carbon emissions that uh, directly go up the stack and all of the reduced carbon abatement uh, opportunity costs that goes into it are just ignored. And we get to count that as, quote, green um, and carbon free. When in fact, as we all know, burning wood produces far more CO2 per BTU of, of usable heat um, than does even burning coal. It's a true farce. Um, let's call it what it is. I mean, it's, it, is, it is a cult um, driven by lies uh, that they know, tell themselves. Uh, it, you know, and uh, Robert Bryce uh, with his new series, The Ju uh, Juice the Series, uh, I believe it's juicetheseries.com. I, I visited with him yesterday and uh, I absolutely love Robert Bryce. And I believe you were at a showing, weren't you, of Juice the Series or a thing just recently, weren't you, Chris? Yeah, I hosted it. Yeah, I'm a oh. partner with Robert in in uh, putting some of these things together or supporter of him and bringing a group in it. Absolutely. We held an event at the museum for it. Isn't that yeah, great? It's, it's the same kind of thing. Robert Ro Robert's a very thoughtful, numbers-based energy guy partnering up with a guy who's a, yep. a, a high-end filmmaker to, to try to communicate these truths about energy. And again, I, they will win in the end, but I do think these efforts to be clear and engage in this dialogue now sooner than later matters because the collateral damage of sort of foolish uh, anti-reality energy policies, that, that, that damage that we used to be mostly over in Europe, it's arriving right here in, certainly in California right. New York, it's starting right here in Colorado. But right away, in right door, in next door neighboring Nebraska, they have the second cheapest electricity in the country, fourth right. or fifth, uh, I mean, second most stable electrical gr grid in the country and fourth or fifth cheapest electricity in the grid. And what's happening in Nebraska? They're massively expanding their electrical producing capacity because industries want to locate where they have affordable, reliable energy. The de I, uh, the deindustrialization of Germany and uh, the, the West is happening. Um, so goes uh, Germany, so goes the EU, and it's terrible. You just mentioned that, uh, Doomberg, and when you know on the how the deindustrialization. You don't have high, uh, you have high energy costs, you lose. What do you guys see about California uh, with its high energy and New York? What do you see happening in the deindustrialization there? Well, I think it's largely happened. I mean, you're seeing this. Um, Exodus out of California to New York to um, states like Florida and Texas. Let's hope they they don't bring their energy policy to those uh, to the new <laughs> to the states, especially Texas. Uh, I think it's a serious threat, by the way. Like Texas produces a, an enormous amount of natural gas and oil, and if the state were to flip from uh, red to blue, even temporarily, they could throw a serious um, a serious uh, wrench in, into that whole machinery. Um, I, I don't think it'll happen, but it's a significant threat. Um, and I, I think in California, um, in a way, and New England, they're, they are the sort of, they're, they're slightly behind Germany in their journey. So the, the way this works is crazy stuff happens in Germany. California and New England copy it. They try to impose it on the rest of the country, and they get significant pushback. So yep. you mentioned Germany and deindustrialization. I think a very serious thing that's going on there that is underreported in the West is the crackdown on liberty which is really, really a big deal. The uh, AFD, which of course right. is considered far right, 
Um, there's talk of banning that party. They're using the full power of the state to um, take away people's ability to work in bank who have supported or donated to such causes. And I believe the current borders of Germany are not necessarily permanent. I think we could see a resplit. Um, AFD is very popular in mm. East German states. This is a reaction to being mismanaged, you know, by their overlords in the West. And I think we could see significant populist wow. uprisings and and a potential uh, a German uh, a bifurcation back to the old East-West Germany divide. Wow. Do you think- Yes, too, could... at, at, at the same dialogue with my son, that when you have these sort of top-down oppressive policies, that if you make energy expensive, not only do, does it make it more expensive for people to live, but blue collar jobs tend to be energy intensive. And then you export those jobs. People get angry about this because you're hurting the quality of their lives. And the, and, and what the response to that top down, uh, very illiberal policies is not a swing back to classical liberalism that probably all of us embrace here about free people and free markets. It's angry populist movements, which we've see, we, we're seeing that everywhere now that is the inevitable result of bad top-down policies that squelch human opportunity C california is driven all the way to the highest adjusted poverty rate in the nation a state with everything going for it um and my fear i'm sitting right here in denver colorado we are going the same direction in colorado i run a business i founded 13 years ago based here in colorado we're building a new manufacturing plant right now are we building in colorado of course not. We're building it in Oklahoma. You know, who's going to build a new energy intensive manufacturing of anything in Colorado? And if no one will do that, where are the high paid blue collar jobs to give middle class lifestyles an opportunity for families? No, that that's pretty impressive. And and uh, I want to give a shout out to you as a leader, Chris. Uh, I've been evaluating companies uh, on finances and financial statements and things and good management, good numbers is what Michael Tanner and I always talk about on our podcast on things. And, um, you've done an outstanding job. Uh, I'm sorry for being polite to you, to your face. I'd, I'll usually wait till you leave the room, but, uh, what is coming around the corner for Liberty? You, you've got some first class things going on. Well, at Liberty, it's a team effort. You know, it's, it's not me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just one of the members of the team that's quite passionate about energy, quite passionate about innovation, quite passionate about finding better ways to do things. Um, so the biggest development we have, it's often called electrification, electric frack fleets, and that's part of it, but that's not the key part of it. The key part of it is moving from combusting diesel to combusting natural gas. And look, there's multiple reasons that it's better to shift your power source, if you can, from diesel to natural gas. The biggest one by far, natural gas is far cheaper than diesel. It's just, you don't have to do much to it. It's just dry natural gas or diesels. Oil is more expensive than natural gas. And then you got to process it into products. Diesel is awesome. It powers the industrial part of the world. So I'm not anti-diesel, but if you have the ability to burn natural gas instead of diesel, it's cheaper. That's advantage number one. Advantage number two is it burns cleaner, meaning less, not in clean by meaning less generation of NOx and particulate matter, less generation of emissions that impact human health in the, in the local neighborhood right away. And maybe a distant third, it's also lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but, but that's, and so it's viewed as like people will pay for it for that reason. But I, I think the, the, the honest reason is natural gas is much cheaper than diesel. And if we can produce energy cheaper, and of course with smaller pollutant impact, that's a good thing for everyone. And look, the last plump on, on our business, or really plump on the shale revolution, by good luck, I, I and some of my colleagues at Liberty were involved in the start of the shale revolution, which is in natural gas in the very late 1990s. Now it's shifted over to oil. But in the, the evolution of that shale revolution, we covered that in the report. You know, there was no meaningful commercial production 20, in the year 2000 from shale. Today, it's 58% of total U.S. primary energy production, not natural gas production, total energy production in the United States. It's about 10% of total global energy production is wow. just from U.S. shale, you know, commercial, not subsidized, not top down. It's very flexible energy that's used for electricity and transportation, making materials, um, heating homes. 
but its innovation can prosper, can continue to drive better and nicer energy. But when you get top-down government picking winners of losers, you put regulatory barriers in place, you will slow innovation. We couldn't have a shale revolution if it was starting just today. No, there's no way. Um, you know, when you sit back and take a look, I, I have to hand it to the Biden administration for not being uh, racist uh, against uh, energy. They're they're holding up even uh, wind and solar farms. There's 24,000 projects attached to the grid or something horrible like that. But uh, so at least they're horrible on their permitting. I'll just leave it at that. But uh, uh, Doomberg, where do you see uh, the next uh, phases in the industry? You and I and Chris were talking about Toby and and some of the things that they have going on. Where are you seeing the U.S. Uh, oil and gas market going? So I just want to build on something Chris just said, because it's really important. Okay. You know, in, in our journey down the rabbit hole of this peak cheap oil movement. And our position, of course, is that peak cheap oil is, is, is a myth. Um, one of the pieces we wrote was called Compressed for Time, where we talk about the fact that we will simply switch out the engines uh, from diesel to compressed natural gas, from gasoline to compressed natural gas. And this not only will take advantage of the energy arbitrage, which is unbelievable today on an energy content basis, um, natural gas in the U.S. is trading for $10 a barrel oil. Um, uh, that's not going to stay around forever. And as you switch out these heavy diesel engines in mining, in um, uh, long haul trucking, and even in passenger vehicles, you are effectively um, arbitraging natural gas into the equivalent of oil and freeing up that incremental barrel of oil to be used in other applications. And therefore, mm. you know, it wouldn't take much in the way of engine switching in order for us to abate a one or 2% um, shortage of oil in the global markets. And we will do it. And as Chris said, it will happen spontaneously because the arbitrage is there. It costs you eight or nine times as much to fuel a tractor with diesel than it does for natural gas. That payback period on getting a Cummins engine that runs on CNG is pretty damn short. And it will happen. Great. Um, the, the, to your question about what we see coming, obviously we have the glut in natural gas, which will work itself out. Market's always clear. Uh, I suspect we might be near a bottom. Um, I, I, I do think that the big challenge here is the geopolitical premium that is currently placed on oil that is keeping it at $80 a barrel, sort of the, the, the blended price between WTI and, and, and Brent, um, right. is driving incremental production ambitions in the Permian, which is saturated with associated gas, and they don't really care about what they do with the natural gas because the primary driver is producing that light, sweet crude. And so we're going to have to see curtailments in the, the dry gas fields or the, or the gas primary fields, particularly, say, in Marcellus, which we're seeing um, uh, going forward. The market needs to balance. You can't have um, natural gas at $2 million BTU forever, given its utility. So we will see a combination of um, uh, of demand destruction, um, sorry, a production destruction and uh, demand increases and even increased exports through Mexico, which is something we're writing about soon, where the market will yep. eventually find its its stable medium. Cool. Your thoughts, Chris? Yes. Yeah, so one, one other thing on, the, on that same thread is I was in Washington recently. One of, one of my messages was because many people are very hopped up on decarbonization. One of the biggest needle movers there could be to be to resource industry in the United States. Now I'm a free market guy, so I don't want I don't want bans on imports. I don't want a forced make things more expensive. Therefore, we're driven to produce them here. But if we change the regulatory environment, so it was easier to permit and build um, energy intensive facilities in the United States, you could have an enormous rise in blue collar industrial jobs and you could have a giant decarbonization. The US for 100 years was the largest industrial powerhouse in the world. Today, industrial production in the United States consumes 25 exajoules a year, roughly a quarter of US energy consumption. In China, industrial energy production is 70 exajoules a year. They're not a little bigger, they're giantly bigger in energy intensive manufacturing. It's just concentrating in China. It's all done there their primary industrial fuel is coal. Our primary industrial fuel is natural gas. If you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and raise American wages, put industrial energy intensive manufacturing in the United States at large scale, 
massively bigger climate impacts than all the wind and solar and subsidies of the IRA, massively cleaner air um, by yep. globally by burning natural gas instead of coal. You know, that would be a climate blue collar wage policy. But of course, as, as, we, as we've all somewhat recognized, most things justified in the name of climate are not really about incremental reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Right. This, this is a name for why we have to have top down design of society and get to pick winners and losers. It's a political right. movement, not really an environmental or greenhouse gas movement. Let me ask both of you, because you bring Chris a fabulous point right on the from Doomberg's fabulous point, And that is with uh, China and there is a movement to India. Uh, India, you know, I got to hand it to the Indian leaders. They're at least trying to elect, you know, get as much power. They, they've they been buying the lower Russian crude, and I applaud them for doing that, getting the lowest amount of energy that they can, everything that they possibly can. Do you think the indus is there, uh, the industrialization of India is happening and companies are more moving to India because of the climate? What are you guys' thoughts on that? Because that, that's a huge issue. I, I can have a stab at it. I, India is a very challenging place to operate and a very challenging place for Westerners to invest in. I think they have serious governance issues and uh, local and regional and, and national uh, government permitting mosaics that are incredibly complex and frankly corrupt. Um, I do think that um, India's energy growth will continue. It's just very difficult for outsiders to participate in that. And I think actually the bigger right. story is uh, as Chris alluded to um, onshoring here in the U.S. and French shoring into Mexico under the NAFTA umbrella right. is probably going to be something that's just as interesting and more tangible for um, listeners to ponder how they might um, invest in such a thing. Um, I just don't and I've sort of soured on India through personal experiences well, and um, and knowledge of, of how that country operates. But Chris and, and, and Doomberg, Chris, you. I'm sorry, sorry, Chris, you've you have electrified your fleet, um, but they are still driven. But what about even the Chinese putting in a EV plant in Mexico to sell to the U.S.? Yeah, get, get, to, to put a qualifier, like to me, my pitch is we should have a lot of blue collar energy intensive jobs in the U.S. I believe that realistically, it's more along the lines of what Doomberg said. Those more of those jobs are going to be in Mexico. They're going to be powered by U.S. natural gas imported down there, U.S. energy. You probably growing electrical infrastructure so they can also have affordable, lower cost energy than China. We can do that in Mexico. And the environmental regulations and the desire for jobs there is going to be stronger. More of that energy wow. intensive manufacturing, I, I believe, is going to be friend short in Mexico than it's going to be placed in the United States. But it's good to have as much as possible of that in the United States. Certainly petrochemicals, that's already happening in the Gulf Coast in the United States. I had right. a friend of mine who works in the refining industry said the coast of Texas and Louisiana is the only place in the Western world you can build uh, large scale manufacturing today. Nowhere else can you permit, you know, a large scale energy intensive manufacturing, but you can on the Texas and Louisiana coast. And of course, a lot of that is happening. That's great. Well, uh, Doomberg, uh, thank you so much. We got about uh, two more minutes here. Uh, what are your thoughts on what's coming around the corner in the market? Yeah, I think um, the thing we're keeping a close eye on is how this natural gas glut um, resolves itself going forward. Also, of course, geopolitical risk. Um, a thing we've been studying a lot lately that we probably won't write about is the military conflict in Ukraine and just how frankly, disastrous that seems to be unfolding for the Western powers and Europe in particular. There's a real catastrophe over there that is being minimized in the Western press. They only admit that the minimum they have to to keep a straight face. But we've made a colossal, potentially fatal error uh, in our adventures overseas, obviously keeping a close eye on the military conflict in the Middle East as well, because that if it should escalate to, say, a kinetic war between the U.S. and Iran, um, you know, I, it's really just amazing how our adventures abroad uh, when we have so much we could do at home. Um, last point I would say is the U.S. energy miracle. We produce 20 percent of the world's crude and petroleum products, and we produce 25 to 30 percent of the world's natural gas now, depending on the latest numbers. This has all been done with a hand and a half tied behind our back. As you just mentioned, you know, you, you look at Louisiana and Texas because of the peculiarities yep. of the state regulatory regimes and those in those states, uh, we've been able to have this boom. Imagine if we in Colorado and in California and in New England um, actually got serious about producing hydrocarbons at scale, we could really, really 
be the world's, well, we are the world's sole energy giga power, and we could probably do twice as much as we're doing today if we got serious about it. We eventually will. Such politics uh, will eventually be swept aside, um, especially in the face of, say, the next energy crisis. And so deep down, ultimately, we're pretty optimistic. And Chris, up to you, the last words. Hey, Stuart, I'll put an explanation point on Doomberg's point there. The United States produced roughly twice as much oil, which really means liquid fuels, than number two, Saudi Arabia and Russia, and over twice as much natural gas as any other country on Earth. So it's hard to overstate the enormous energy powerhouse and advantage the United States has. And as I said, look, hydrocarbons market share isn't even shrinking over the last 12 years. But if you look at 50 or 100 years, what could be a meaningful addition to a hydrocarbon dominated energy system? And man, that list is short, but the top of that list by far is nuclear. So small modular reactors, energy dense production that can not just generate electricity, which delivers 20% of global energy, but can also deliver process heat. So they're not gonna replace hydrocarbons, but they could be a meaningful addition in allowing us to grow the total energy pie so the other 7 billion people that aren't among the lucky 1 billion people can live lives like all of us in the next few decades. That's that's the goal. More energy, better energy makes better lives for humans. And uh, Chris, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Doug Sandridge. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big uh, oil executives for uh, nuclear uh, fan as well. Uh, I'm all about uh, nuclear and I, I really want to visit with you, Chris, as well. Uh, about the nuclear ideas on modular reactors. And so for that, Doomberg, thank you again. I'd give you a hug, but uh, the ink would run <laughs> off. Uh, so again, thank you, Chris. I do appreciate both of you so much. Great to be with both of you.